say the first philosophical problem is the problem of the one and the many. How is there all this diversity? Look at all of our faces, different, different, different. God is clearly comfortable with diversity. It's the only game in town. There's nothing else but diversity, you know. How do we put together diversity with absolute unity? I put it in my pocket just in case we go down this road. I know you've seen this. You take what looks like diversity, you put it in a wheel of infinite love, the infinity unites the diversity so perfectly together that you have absolute unity, as it were. What looks like three is one. That's the first philosophical problem was solved by the Christian definition of God. Now, what your secular humanist, I'm not putting them down by saying that, but what they want is to tolerate the diversity. And they're right, because we haven't been very good at that, you know. Uh, what we want to do, if you're at least a mystical Christian, is you want to hold on to the absolute unity. That I and the Father are one. I am one with my neighbor. I am one with Jesus. I am one with, with creation. Only the mystics tend to understand that. The normal street corner Christian never gets that far. But that's the goal. That's why Jesus can tell us to even love our enemies. Uh, because he, he believes in what we call non-dual consciousness. So our definition of love holds the two together. Our definition of love is given us by the shape of God. That we're going to hold on to the absolute right for the Father to be the Father and not the Son, the Son to be the Son and not the Holy Spirit, and yet they are absolutely one too. That's a paradox. That's a contradiction. Huh? Uh, so our understanding of love, based on this template, on this model, is not just protecting diversity, but also protecting radical unity. Radical unity. And I am afraid, at least in my conversations, with most liberal types, and people think I'm a liberal type, but I'm just as critical of them as I am conservatives, uh, is they don't have much profound sense of the unity, of the radical unity between God and the soul, between my soul and your soul, between this race and that race, between that gender and that gender. In fact, Christianity up to now has emphasized the diversity, not the unity. And then not known how to put the Humpty Dumpty together again. You know? uh, so don't let yourself be written off as, oh yeah, you're just into this cheap tolerance. Everything is beautiful. In fact, I, I warn you, if you grow in the spirit, you will grow in an increased appreciation for diversity, but it will, um, it will make you more aware of when that individual diversity has not expected much of itself or has not grown up. Uh, in other words, your, your recognition of evil, if I can, actually sharpens. <laughs> Just the opposite of what they think. Uh, no, that isn't good. That isn't real. That isn't true. That doesn't mean I have to reject such a person or I have to exclude such a person. But I can't go back to that either, you see. So again, you know, the true spiritual life is always paradoxical. You're holding two seeming contraries together. And so this is another one of them. Your height... Your, your recognition is heightened of the nature of evil, but your capacity for loving the person trapped in evil is actually increased. Uh, you don't pity them. You don't look down on them. You don't dismiss them. Because usually, you know, I was there once myself, usually. <laughs> uh, so it's taken me all my life to to try to say that with some kind of coherence because I know it usually doesn't make sense. People want to position you as either liberal or conservative in our culture. Well, I'm radically conservative first. And because of that, 
I end up looking radically liberal. Isn't that a paradox? <laughs> yeah, uh, it still is a surprise to me how both are true. But be prepared to see that in yourself. And when Jesus says the, the human one has no place to lay his head, I think that's what he's talking about. You can't lay your head in the liberal camp and you can't lay your, help in the, uh, your head in the conservative camp. Both of them aren't your spacious place where grace has led you. So it's always the dance with otherness. Again, diversity that by the infinity of the love becomes unity. You're, you're going to see the pattern everywhere. Can we protect diversity and unity at the same time? That's the art form. That's the ultimate art form. You can't get any better than that. Probably the biggest single heresy of fundamentalism is that it turned around the biblical notion of faith 180 degrees. Faith clearly means the very word means walking in darkness, not certitude, not light, right? darkness. And the fundamentalists found the most clever way to look like they were walking in darkness, and they don't take a single step unless they've got a scripture to back them up. You understand? That's not faith anymore. The opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is certitude. And it's people who are falsely certain who've committed most of the monstrosities of history. And that can be documented. You know, and they usually had God backing them up. <laughs> uh, we, we just can't go there anymore. That is not the meaning of faith. Faith is when you have just enough light to embrace the darkness. Even if you take a picture of absolute darkness, now we have better and better cameras to now prove scientifically there is no such thing as absolute darkness. It is filled with rays of light called neutrinos. There is no such thing as absolute darkness. Light is everywhere. And it gets better. The one absolute in the whole universe is the speed of light. There is actually only one light and all light is connected. Here's where theology and science are all coming together. Now once we know that's true, we don't need to be afraid of darkness anymore. But we know what we've been given is the ability not to run from it, but to transform it, to forgive it, to absorb it. And that's for me what Jesus is doing on the cross. He's absorbing the darkness of history. He, he, there's no call for recrimination, retributive justice. He, do, he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He lets the evil of history flow through him and forgives it. That's a new storyline for history. It's in 2,000 years later, most Christians don't even know that storyline. They really don't. Until we return to the biblical notion of faith, I don't see any renewal in Christianity. I don't see that we're going to be a sign of the new creation, the next generation. How could that kind of thinking ever make Jesus the Savior of the world when all it's expert at is excluding? <laughs> you know, all it tells is who doesn't belong, who doesn't belong, who doesn't belong, you know? If Jesus is to be, as John 4 says, the Savior of the world, then we got a very different mind to access that knows how to love the not me, the other, <laughs>